this God cares for us. And so this God who is so great, who has created all that is seen, knows us and loves us. So he is great. He is our creator. And he is greatly to be praised because of all that he does for us. So we are going to praise him uh, for all that he does this morning. Pray. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And praise the Father, and praise the Son, and praise the Spirit now with us. Every moment, all our days, God be praised, oh God be praised. God with morning breaking light. Praise Him through darkness of the night. Praise Him with every breath of church will invite you to take a moment this morning to greet one another as we're doing that i do uh, want to remind us all of the great uh, blessing that god has given us that we are growing so much and with that in mind um, i invite you to also get a little comfortable with the people in your pew gather in a little close to make room for those who might be coming in late
Good morning, good morning. Good morning. Wow. We are talkative for it being day today. I love it. I love it. My name is Pastor Jordan. Well, that's not my name. My name's Jordan, but I'm Pastor Jordan. Uh, if you're new here, we'd love to connect with you. Fill out a connection card. You can drop it in one of the boxes in the back or give it to one of our hosts out in the foyer. If you're new here, welcome. We are currently in our Mark Discipleship Series, and we have just a few announcements for you this morning. First, obviously coming up, we have Holy Week. So that's a lot going on. Uh, we have our Seder meal at 6 p.m. on Thursday. We would love for those who are interested or want to come to register. Um, it's free. We just want to know how many people we're having and uh, make sure we have enough food and everything. Uh, following that at 7 p.m., we'll have a foot washing and communion service. And then moving on to Good Friday, we'll have a reflective service, not at 6 p.m., not at 6 p.m., not at 6 p.m., at 7 p.m., Good Friday at 7 p.m., and then on Sunday, we'll have two services, one at 9 and one at 1030, and we love how many people we have here. We love how many more people are coming, and our kids will be with us during the service, so that's going to fill it out even more. So, that's Holy Week. And then moving on, we have our prayer partners, which is starting this Wednesday. It starts the 13th, and then it goes through the 20th and the 27th. The deadline to sign up for that, to be on that, was today. But if you really want to still come, feel free to connect with uh, one of our staff, and we'll make sure we get you signed up. Uh, we're really focused on creating cross-generational discipleship, prayer, conversation, and this is one of our main avenues for that. And then lastly is our senior saints. We have a potluck luncheon here at the church Thursday the 21st at 1 p.m. Those are announcements for today. Let me pray so we can get back into worship. Lord, I just thank you for um, the church, the people that are here today, Lord. I thank you for this building and the freedom to come and worship you, to learn about you, and to be in relationship with you. Father, I pray over the service today. I pray over Pastor Jason that um, you, would, you would use him, you would use the words that you've given him, and that you would open our ears and our hearts to what you have for us. I thank you for the ways that you've prepared us this week for your message. God, I pray over the rest of worship that we would turn our hearts to you, that we would in every way possible, be turned to you, to fix our eyes on you, Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. So we ask this in your name. Amen. Deep 
I enter rest I depend on you I depend on you for eternal life to be raised with Christ I depend on you oh I depend on you you're the way the truth and the life you're the Think of his goodness, church. Come on, let's sing. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness. Surrender now. 
the goodness of God. Lord, we praise you that you are good. Remind our hearts in every moment of your goodness. Lord, that we might know you more and that it may drive us to respond. That as we sit with your kindness, that it would lead us to repentance. That as we sit with your faithfulness, that it would lead us to trust you. Because we know that you have been faithful and that you have been so good in all of our lives. Every moment, there's never been a moment where you have not been faithful and that you have not been good. So Lord, would you work in our hearts that we might see you for who you are and that that we might respond by laying everything down for you. Sing this. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me, save thou. Amen. Church, we can take a seat, and kids, you are dismissed to your classes. morning. Welcome to Granger Missionary Church. We're so glad to have you here with us this morning. If you have your Bibles, let me invite you to turn to them as we walk through Mark's gospel. Today we are going to be in Mark chapter 8, and I'm going to read the scripture for us, and then we will walk through it together. So Mark chapter 8 is where we are this morning, and it's starting in verse 27 is where we'll be. The word of the Lord says this, and Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? 
And they told him, John the Baptist. And others say, Elijah. And others, one of the prophets. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on things of God, but on the things of man. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life would, will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So we're at the beginning of this journey where Jesus will now begin to reveal himself more and more and more and and what he came to do, taking whatever image they have of him and refocusing them, healing their sight, so that they begin to understand not only who Jesus really is, but how they are to follow him. And that's what we want to see today. Because on the way, it says in verse 27, Jesus asks his disciples, who do people say that I am? Now that's an interesting phrase. Jesus is is asking not because he's somehow curious about what the popular uh, opinion of him is, Jesus is currently in, as we said, Caesarea Philippi, which also has the name of Caesarea Pan, because they, they worshipped the, the uh, uh, god Pan, which was the, the half goat, half man. I mean, come on, if people think Christians are weird, I mean, who's, who's gonna really going to be like bowing down to a half goat, half man? That seems really strange to me. But that was what they worshipped in that area. So it was so far north in Israel, it was many times, uh, many areas around there were just straight pagan as they worshipped and had uh, gods that would oversee the flocks like this pond. And so this was a pagan environment. Jesus sees that all around him. And it's in that environment where people have a wrong view of God and maybe even no view of Jesus that Jesus says, hey, who do people say that I am? And Jesus asks this seemingly innocuous question, just a question about public opinion. And so the disciples answer that the people see Jesus as a prophet. And so they're more than likely referring to the Jews. They're partially right. Jesus is a prophet, but Jesus is so much greater. He's a prophet, a priest, and he's a king. And this may sound great. Jesus is likened to some of the greatest prophets and the most moral men in history. But it's a far cry from who Jesus really is as the God of all creation who can hold the whole world together at his very will. So the first question for you then is, we don't live in a place that I hope worships half goat, half men. But let me ask you, who does the world say Jesus is? As you listen to your friends, listen to your family, listen to coworkers, who's Jesus then? What picture comes to their mind? How would they describe him? Maybe a, a good moral example. We should all be more like Jesus, loving our enemies. He's all about love. He's just, you know, we, he gives in to everybody and he, he loves everybody. He's just a really nice guy. Maybe they understand him just to be a wise teacher. Je- Jesus was like a sage. He just gave us some good advice that we should all follow. He's a religious figurehead, similar to Muhammad or Buddha, just the guy that started this this whole thing of religion called Christianity. Maybe he's just an exaggerated legend. Look, he was a guy back in the first century, but over the years and over the seasons and over time, things have grown to where people have made him into a miracle worker because they're longing for something more. What does the world say about Jesus? That he's just a good man? But then I love how Jesus, after he hears what they say, he, 
he doesn't stop and try to correct them. He says, okay, well, that's great. I'm, I'm, I'm glad to hear what you know about what the world says about me, but let me ask you another question. He says, who do you say that I am? One commentator said this, Jesus is not content to know what others think and say of him. His mission is not decided by his standing in the polls or by the judgment of each follower whom he has called. But what about you, Jesus says? Who do you say that I am? This judgment, this author says, cannot be rendered by collecting more evidence and data or by further deliberations, observations, discussions, or explanations. The disciples must move from the status of passive recipients to active participants. At some point, the colleagues of Jesus and everyone who has ever heard his name must look deep within Jesus and deep within themselves and risk a decision that will entail either a commitment or a severance from the identity and mission of Jesus. Do you hear what he's saying? Jesus moved from just the innocuous, external question of who do people say that I am to the internal, risky, exposing question of who do you say that I am. And it's with that question that risk comes of either aligning yourself fully with Jesus and all that that means when you understand who Jesus is, or walking away from Jesus, saying you want nothing to do with him. That question causes you a fork in the road as a follower of Jesus. And as this commentator points out, it's not just for the disciples. It's a question for each of us. It's a little bit different about if I ask you and someone, hey, what do, what do people think about my preaching, right? And you can be like, well, I've heard some people complain about how long you take, you're boring, you're dry, your jokes are stupid, you know, you know. And they're like, but, I, you know, I, this, is what I, this, this is what I hear other people say. And I'm like, that's great. What do you think about my preaching? Ugh, okay, um, well, you're dry, you're broke. No, you know, they'd have to come up with something because you'd feel a little more awkward because now I'm asking a personal question. That's what Jesus did. You see, knowing Jesus is based on personal understanding, not public opinion. Jesus doesn't care if you know what other people say about him. Jesus wants to know what you say about him. See, there's a public, there's a popular understanding of Jesus, and then there's this personal understanding of Jesus. One is based on what other people say, and that's pretty easy to explain and express, but another one is based on who you know Jesus to be. Have you ever really looked to see who Jesus is? Beyond public opinion, beyond what you grew up with Sunday school, beyond photos and movies, the chosen and flannel graph. Do you know who Jesus is? How would you know? Just from stories you've heard, preaching from church, Sunday schools? Or have you really looked to find who Jesus is through the scriptures? Who do you say that I am is the central question of Mark's gospel. This is right at the center of Mark's gospel. And it's at the center of the questions in your life. It's the singular answer of the gospel. This is what the gospel came to show, who Jesus is. And if there's one point of application that echoes from this passage through millennia of culture and contexts and rings just as clear, just as true, just as raw as it does today, it's this one. Who do you say that Jesus is to you? Not to the church, not to your kids, but to you. It was a question for Peter. It's a question for you. It's a question for each one of us. And so Peter answered Jesus, you're the Christ. And I love what it says then, and he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. Seems kind of counterintuitive to the one who came to establish the kingdom of God, doesn't it? But we'll see in just the following verses why he does not yet want them to tell, them, uh, tell others about Jesus. Because while Peter was right in what he said, he was wrong in what he understood about Jesus as the Christ. Because Knowing who Jesus is doesn't mean you understand everything he does. How many of you have ever been confused by your walk in the Christian life? You thought following Jesus was going to lead this direction, and then you find yourself in a desert. You find yourself in a different place. You find yourself saying, Jesus, I know that you are the Son of God, and I have no idea how I got here in this mess, in this problem. 
Knowing who Jesus is doesn't mean you understand everything he does. You see, in the next uh, couple of sentences, Jesus begins to teach them that the Son of Man, referring to himself, must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, scribes, and then he says, and then I'm going to die. I'm going to be killed. They're going to kill me. And it says in verse 32, he said this plainly. Up to this, he'd been speaking a lot in parables. And so the disciples, I almost have in this, pictures, this pictured in my mind of the disciples looking at Jesus going, whoa, 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 slow down. What did you just say is going to happen to you? you we're on the way to Jerusalem. And what's going to happen? You see, Peter had answered rightly, but somewhat blindly. Like the blind man, he saw Jesus, but it was blurry. He knew it was Jesus, but he couldn't see all the definition that that meant. Peter claimed that Jesus was the Christ, the Messiah. That's what that term means in the Greek, uh, is a translation of the Hebrew, which was the anointed one, the Messiah, the, the Messiah. Messiah means the anointed one of God. Peter was right. Jesus knew that Peter, the disciples, and many others had very little idea of what the Messiah would really be and what he would come to do. See, three types of people were anointed in the Old Testament, prophets, priests, and kings. And so in the Old Testament, from 2 Samuel chapter 7, most likely, is where many understood that the that the thinking of the Messiah would come from. When in 2 Samuel, God promised this to King David, when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. So another anointed king from the line of King David would establish a kingdom. This is what the, old, the people in the Old Testament understood. He shall build, God says, a house for my name, and, and I will establish his throne of his kingdom forever. And so for those in the Old Testament, they understood that the Messiah, the anointed king of the line of David, would come and establish his kingdom forever. And so those, when they heard the Messiah, that Jesus might be the Messiah, got excited because these Romans don't belong in our country. They need to get out of here, and we need God to establish his home, his throne, the temple, and then his king forever. We're going to kick these Romans out, and we're going to have a new kingdom just like King David had. Not realizing, as Jesus is trying to explain to them, that the kingdom that's going to last forever is not an earthly one. It's a heavenly one. They don't want an earthly kingdom. They shouldn't want it. They want a heavenly kingdom. So, Peter is standing there listening to Jesus give a whole redefinition of what everybody under already understood Messiah was supposed to be. And surely, just as Peter would, pulls Jesus aside and tries to correct his theology. Jesus. <laughs> I don't know where you were in Sunday school, but I certainly know 2 Samuel chapter 7. And the Messiah is not going to come. The Messiah is not going to suffer. And the Messiah is not going to be killed. Have you not read the Bible, Jesus? And almost Jesus has been there, done that. I'm the one who established David. What does Jesus say to Peter? And actually the scripture points out that it's not just Peter that he's saying it to, but all the other disciples who are probably listening in at this point going, yeah, Jesus, we all know who the Messiah is supposed to be and what he's supposed to do. Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Now in this statement, he's not calling Peter Satan, He's calling Peter's statement satanic. That wrong-headed idea of an earthly success is exactly what Satan wants to distract from the heavenly victory that Jesus came to bring. The idea that somehow the blessing is to be only on this earth, in this kingdom, and not to reach to the heavenly kingdom that Jesus wants to establish and give eternal life to everyone is satanic in its thinking. Jesus wants to lift them. He says, get behind me, Satan. I don't want to just establish a kingdom here, though it may be easy for Jesus to do so. How many of you are like, boy, I'm hoping over the next several weeks to die a horrible, horrible death? 
I'm expecting it as a matter of fact. I know that if I stay here, I'm safe, but if I go there, that's where I'll be killed. And so you know what? I can't wait to get in my car and drive there. But that's what Jesus did. The scripture, one of my favorite scriptures is when it says that Jesus, after he had accomplished a lot of miracles in different areas, he looked at Jerusalem and it says he set his face like flint toward Jerusalem. It's as if Jesus said, it's here, it's now, and that's where I'm going. This is serious stuff for Jesus. And I'm sure the temptation was just, you know, just live your life easy, Jesus. For that, he says, just get behind me. The satanic thinking. Can you imagine how confusing that was for Peter? We often talk about Jesus. And his, can you imagine Peter like, wait, 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 wait just a minute here. Like, one second ago, you were like, high five, Peter. You got the answer right. And now all of a sudden, um, the son of Beelzebub? Like, how is this working, Jesus? Like, I thought I was right, and now I'm wrong. How can I be right and wrong? Anybody ever been there, right? You talk to your parents, and you're like, how am I both right and wrong at the same time? This makes no sense. Peter was there. So if you get nothing else, you can identify with Peter there, right? It was confusing to Peter. Jesus was supposed to go to Jerusalem to sit on a throne, not hang on a cross. They had misunderstood what Isaiah was prophesying about. As a matter of fact, we have no evidence from the Old Testament that any of the Jewish writers understood the idea of the suffering servant, the suffering Messiah. It's only after Jesus that really their eyes were opened after Jesus explained it to them that it made sense. And before we think that it was back written into the scriptures from those after Jesus to say, oh, we'll make Jesus, because he wasn't king, we'll make him a suffering servant, and it looks good. Jesus himself said, this is what I'm coming to do. And the reality is this, Jesus and the Christian life following Jesus, it can be confusing at times. You can be here today and have a clear understanding that Jesus is the Son of God. You could have confessed it at VBS, or at Sunday school, or on a Sunday morning, or in a Bible study, and said, Jesus is the Christ, and I'm going to follow him, and still be very confused about what it means to follow him and where he's going. You know what? You're in good company. If your Christian life is confusing to you, and you don't know what Jesus is doing with you, <laughs> you're in good company. With Peter, the disciples, and I would venture to guess with a show of hands, just about everybody else in this room. See, knowing Jesus and who Jesus is doesn't mean you've figured out everything that he's doing. You've been a faithful follower of Jesus, but you find your place now in a space of suffering. How, is, how does that make sense? You have the right answer about who Jesus is. You didn't expect Jesus to lead you here 20 years ago. Jesus didn't tell you that this was going to be part of your life when you signed up for this whole Christian thing. And while you may not understand where Jesus is taking you, even though you know who he is, here's, here's the next thing we see from this passage. You don't need to have Jesus all figured out in order to faithfully follow him. You don't have to have it all figured out. If you're confused about what it means to follow Jesus, that's okay. Because Jesus isn't concerned that you know the way where he is leading you. His question to you is if you know who he is. Because if you know who he is, you know you can follow him anywhere. See, Jesus in verse 34, after he speaks to Satan, and, or say, <laughs> he speaks to Peter and calls him Satan, he then turns to the crowds that are around the disciples and calls them all in and gives them a general understanding of what it means to follow him. He says to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. I'm sure there was some murmuring around the crowd at that point. And then from there, he gives the, the purpose statements as to why he says this. For whoever would save his life would lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. He play, has a little play on words there because uh, that word for, for life can mean both um, a physical life and a spiritual life. So he's kind of saying whoever would save his own physical life 
will lose it, but whoever loses his physical life for my life and for my sake in the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world but forfeit his soul? And then the, the third purpose statement, for what can a man give in return for his soul? Whoever is ashamed of me, my words, in this generation, I'll be ashamed of them when I return. So you don't need to have Jesus all figured out in order to faithfully follow him. Jesus' answer to Peter's misconception of Jesus' purpose was not to give Peter some sort of biblical theological survey of the Messiah or an exegesis of Isaiah 53 with commentary about how the Messiah would one day fulfill the suffering servant. He wasn't like, Peter, you got it all wrong. Let me school you. He said, Peter, you don't have it clear yet. Follow me. You're going to have to deny yourself. Put aside those things you thought were going to be the way and follow me in the way that I'm going. Jesus was less concerned about clearing Peter's thoughts than he was about directing his steps. You don't need to have Jesus all figured out. You just need to follow him. Because you are following who Jesus is and not what you think he might be doing. Jesus didn't ask his disciples, hey, hey guys, uh, we're on the way now. We're in Caesarea Philippi and we're on the way. One day they're going to write about this. Some dude's going to preach about it. We're on the way, all right? So where do you think we're going? Anybody have any guesses? Any guesses? Anybody, anybody know? We're going to, you know, Bethlehem. Nope. We're going to Nazareth. Nope. He didn't ask them where they were going. He asks them, who do you say that I am? Because if you know who I am, you know my goodness, you know my power, you know who I am, you'll follow me, even if it means, guys, we're heading into some suffering. In other words, we need to trust Jesus because we understand who he is, not because we figured him out. You can follow Jesus even if you don't know where he's leading you. You just need to be willing to follow him, whatever the cost. And Jesus gives what that cost might be here. He says, the first thing we need to be able to do is deny ourselves. If you're not willing to drop your own desires and expectations to follow Jesus, then he is not your Lord He's your idol. I really wrestle, I, that, that thought, uh, I was actually with my family yesterday and I said, hey guys, I have this thought, just kind of blew my mind, but if we're not willing to drop our own desires and follow Jesus wherever he leads us, he's not our Lord, he's our idol. I'm like, can I say that about Jesus? Can I say Jesus is an idol? And I thought, well, yes, I can, if the idea is we have the wrong picture of Jesus, because it's not really Jesus we're following at that point, we're following some savior we made up. We made the image of Jesus into our own desires. Jesus is supposed to lead me into a life that has no problems. When I follow Jesus, I should have blessing. When I follow Jesus, I don't get cancer. When I follow Jesus, marriages don't break up. When I follow Jesus, things get better, not worse. And if we're following Jesus just to make things better, to fulfill our own desires, we're not following Jesus, we're following an idol. We were made to reflect Christ, but too often we want Christ to reflect us and our desires. And so Jesus says, look, you guys, you don't see it clearly. That's okay, but you just need to know who I am and forget your desires and follow me. If my understanding of Christ and I are similar, it means only one of two things. Either I have become sanctified and Christ-like because we look the same and reflect the same desires, or I have redefined Christ to reflect me. And then one day when things don't go the way that I think they should, I'm disillusioned and I want to deconstruct Christ rather than reconstruct my faith and my, my image of who Christ is. I don't know how many people I've talked to that have lost their faith, and when you talk to them, it's not, more than likely is not because they have some sort of understanding, better understanding of Scripture, or because they have deepened their understanding of theology. It's because they can't rationalize the pain in their lives with following Christ. But I can't get past why they don't see that coming when you read this passage. Jesus says, I'm going to lead you that way. I'm going to suffer. Be willing to suffer too. But don't worry about the path. Worry about following me on the path. The only safeguard against this idea is to understand Christ as he's revealed to us in Scripture. 
We have four Gospels that are like uh, facets on a gem that when you hold them up to the light, see a beautiful picture of Jesus. They are not contradictory. They blend together and tell the story of the greatest man who is also God who ever walked this earth. And we get a better picture of who Jesus is, apart from whatever's been in our mind eye, apart from whatever movie we've seen, apart from whatever picture or portrait has been placed before us, we get a clear picture of who Jesus is. The blurriness disappears, and we see that Jesus has called us to deny ourselves. We realize that Jesus isn't following what the world says. He's not just a good moral teacher. He's not woke. He's not worried about following what people say they should follow. Jesus isn't for our just, just for our justification and for popular things and popular agendas. Jesus is Christ, and we bow to him. We don't use him for our own desires. Otherwise, we've made an idol, and we will be disappointed. Every idol crumbles. Only Jesus remains. Jesus says we need to deny ourselves, deny our own desires, and and, and our own thinking about what Jesus might be doing in our lives. Focus on Jesus. And then he says, take up your cross. I'm sure you've heard before the cross, you know, we don't have a picture of that really today. Someone said, well, it's like hanging an electric chair around your, your neck. I'm like, even that's weird today. Like, I don't, I don't even, that doesn't do anything for me. The cross, as we see it as a beautiful picture, as a symbol that we hang up here, would have been shocking to the first century. It was a symbol of guilt, of shame, of pain. It stripped you of everything in your life and even of your life. It was giving up control completely and letting others abuse you. That's what the cross means. Jesus gave himself over to the Romans, the ones that just a second ago, Peter and the whole crowd thought Jesus was coming to overthrow. Jesus then gives himself over to cruel overlords who controlled Jesus' life until he killed them, or they killed him. So why would Jesus do this? Why would Jesus, instead of coming in victory, Come to be suffering, beaten, and killed because Jesus understood the cost, the cost of victory. Jesus understood the worth was more valuable than the cost. That worth was you. That's why Jesus set his face like flint. What did he get out of the deal? He was God before we all made this mess. I don't know about you, but if I were Jesus, I'd be like, you made your bed, now lie in it. I can make a whole nother one of these. Have you not seen how many stars there are? I just got to go like, I got a couple more earths. No problemo. But it says that before the foundation of the world, God had already spun this out in his mind. And said, they're going to reject me. They're going to make a mess of things. The only way to fix this is for someone to take their place. To suffer and die. What they deserve. It's going to be shameful. It's going to be awkward. They're not even going to know it. They're not even going to understand it. They're not even going to want it. And Jesus said, right here. Jesus is calling his followers to be willing to give up their lives and even endure suffering and shame for his sake, realizing the cost is worth it. It's not worth it if my desires have not yet been dropped. If I have not yet denied myself, I'm not picking up a cross. That makes no sense. But once I humble myself and realize it's not this earthly kingdom that Jesus wants to give us, it's the heavenly kingdom then I can drop my desires and pick up the cross, whatever it means, so that others might see Jesus. The world has seen enough of half-committed followers of Christ. You can find them anywhere. They're a dime a dozen. They're willing to pick up their Bibles, tell you all the things they think are in it, but they're not willing to pick up the cross. It's not what Jesus said to do. They're willing to give a little tithe, but they're not willing to give everything. Their lives, their desires, their future. 
They're willing to sit in a pew in church, but they're not willing to stand for Christ at work when it means they might get a demotion or get fired if they stand for truth and stand for the right things. See, standing with Jesus on Sunday, but being too nervous to be a witness for him on Monday is not following Jesus. It's a half-committed Christian, which is no Christian life to be lived. If we're ashamed of Christ, and the passage says, or his words. So you can be, see, you can stand with Christ. You can tell people you're a Jesus follower, and if in their picture it means a good moral teacher who loves everybody, they might even applaud you. But if you're, as this scripture says, willing to stand not only with Christ, but his words, which are found here, that is what's going to set you apart and possibly cause you ridicule and shame. But Jesus calls us to pick that up and stand with him and follow him, even if it's confusing. If we're ashamed of Christ or his words now, he'll be ashamed of us when he returns. I hate that verse because there have been times when I have not stood as well as I should have for Christ and I fear Christ looking at me with anything but a smile this doesn't mean that we're ashamed to say we follow Jesus it means that we're willing to stand on everything that he said Jesus said we are to be unashamed of him and his words. This means not being ashamed to claim that God determines the gift of gender. It's not a popular statement nowadays, especially when many who claim that would say that Jesus loves them just the way they are. So if you're a Jesus follower, you must think just like them. But if you say, but no, Jesus said there's a difference between genders, and he created them in the garden. He's created them with a specific gender and a specific role. That will get you weirded out by many people and cause you to walk with the cross. It means that we call the act of homosexuality a sin. It means that we claim abortion to be murder. It means that we serve the foreigner among us and love them. It means that we care for the orphan and the widow in their distress and their mess. It means that we wait until we're married to have sex. It means that we serve rather than expect to be served. It means that we stand with the abused even if that means we turn in our friends. It means that we look like a fool in the eyes of our family, our coworkers, and friends if it means we do the right thing. It means we love our enemies across the ocean and across the aisle. We were all fine with standing with Jesus, but are we okay with standing with his words? How can we ask Jesus to stand with us if we're not willing to walk with him? There's a quote by the British revivalist Henry Varley. It's often attributed to D.L. Moody, and it says this, The world has yet to see what God can do with a man fully consecrated to him. The world has yet to see what would come for men and women who truly deny themselves, take up their cross, get rid of a popular picture of Jesus, and follow Christ as Lord. Many have rejected the cost of following Christ for the comfort of a blurry Jesus. They're happy with the blurry Jesus. Now, if you think that what I've just said sounds too fanatical, too extreme, probably can't post it on social media, I challenge you to find some other way to understand this passage. There is no other way. So, two questions. Who is Jesus to you? I'm not asking the congregation for the public opinion. I'm asking you. Because it's not we who need to give an answer, it's you. It's not we who will stand before Jesus, it's you. When he looks at you on the other side of this life and says, who do you say that I am? Who is Jesus to you? This was the question of a Latino church that I had been uh, working with back in Pennsylvania. As they would come to, to do baptism and everybody would step into the tank, that was their question. Who is Jesus to you? It wasn't, have you trusted in Jesus as your Lord and Savior? They said, who's Jesus to you? And they would expect that the person in the tank would have to give a true picture of who Jesus is to them, not just what the church says. Who is Jesus to you? Is he a wise teacher to help you live a clean life? Is he a good example for you to follow so that you're at least moral? Is he a religious relic that your pastor or your parents once talked about? 
Is he a go-to when things get really, really tough and you need someone to just get you through? Or, as the Latino church would say, el es mi vida. Jesus is my life. He's my righteousness. He's the very reason I can have eternal life. He exchanged his righteousness for my sin. He's my savior. I had no other way to God. He's my treasure for whom I'd give up everything this world has to offer. He's my life. Second question is, will you follow him then, whatever it requires, even if it's confusing, even if it costs? Perhaps you're here today and you know who Christ is, but you're confused at what he's doing in your life. You're still not married, still not healed, still no answer, still not free, still don't get it. Remind yourself again who Christ is. He is God, and he is good. Maybe you're here today, and you're not really sure who or what you're following, whether it's really Jesus or an idol. You've not really been confronted with this question before and had to answer it. Jesus is more of a concept than actually Christ in your life. Please hear me, today is the day to make that commitment or recommitment to Christ. Say, I don't know where we're going, Jesus, but I need to know who you are. Jesus was not ashamed of you when he carried his cross. He was not ashamed of you when he was beaten. He didn't even speak a word as he was beaten. But if he did, maybe it would have been your name. Say, this is why I'm doing it. He wasn't ashamed when he was bloodied. He wasn't ashamed when people spit on him. He wasn't ashamed when he was whipped, cussed at, cursed, or crushed. He wasn't ashamed of you when he hung naked on a cross for everyone to laugh at. He was not ashamed to give his life for you. Will you be ashamed to just commit your life to him? He is good to you, but he is also God. Let's respond. Father, I ask that your spirit would just work in our hearts today. That you would cause us to respond. God, we need to be a church that's not full of half-committed Christians. I wish there was an easier way to preach this passage. I looked for an easier way to preach this passage because it's just as convicting to my heart as it is to all of our hearts. How can I live more committed to Christ? Do I turn red when people know that I'm a pastor? Do I get shameful or feel shameful or guilt when they say, why didn't you do something different with your life? Jesus, you weren't ashamed of me. You weren't ashamed of us. Jesus, I don't know how everybody in this room will answer that question. Who do you say that I am? But I pray, Father, that your spirit would cause us and open our eyes, help us to see you rightly, maybe for the first time today. And if that's you, if this is the first time you truly understand who Jesus is, I invite you to the altar where we can pray with you and explain to you the love that Jesus has for you. Maybe we just need to recommit our lives. Maybe we're feeling like it's okay. We, we know that we've trusted in Christ, but we need to say, I am going to be a full, fully committed follower of Jesus, whatever that means. Jesus, you are God, and you are good to us. And we need to be reminded of that. And you have been so good to us, but you are still God, and we need to submit to you. I pray that you would cause that to be the direction of our hearts, even as we worship in your name.
good is he? Far beyond what eyes could ever see. Yet he stands in front of me. How good is he? He paints a canvas with a million stars. Still he holds my heart. And our Father in heaven, the light of salvation, oh, how good is He, the breath of Almighty before and behind me, oh, how good is He. good is he? Forgiveness isn't bound by circumstance. He's the God of second chance. How good is he? When a sinner's heart is all that I can bring. Still he welcomes me. Yes, he does. Well, how how good is he? to honor the love that he showed us. Sing everything. Everything with everything for everything Thank you Jesus Everything with everything for everything How 
que decir. Let me invite you one more time as we close today. If you could just close your eyes, picture Jesus, and let's, let's give this picture instead of whatever was in your mind before. Paul writes this, He, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by Him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through Him and for Him. And He is before all things. And in Him all things hold together. And He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything He might be preeminent. For in Him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through Him to reconcile to Himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of His cross. This is Jesus who gave Himself for you, loves you, and calls you to follow Him regardless of the cost. May you go and live and walk following Jesus this week. God bless you as you go.